on, on natural ecosystem impacts. Uh, I appreciate uh, that you're here. We also welcome our colleagues in Pune and uh, the participants that are in Zoom. Uh, thank you very much for being here. We will have um, six participants and possibly one online from Pune. Um, so we, um, we have uh, um, one of the co-chairs is Marco Reale and myself, Teresa Cavazos. And also we have two uh, young scientists helping us um, doing the, um, the summary, the repertoire is uh, Sheila Estrada, please, Sheila <laughs> is, uh, is up there. And, uh, and also Francesca Saravara is over there as well. So if you have any question, please come with us. Uh, the, our participants will have 10 minutes for uh, um, the, their presentation and then two minutes for questions. And we need to be tied with the, um, with the time. And one minute before the 10 minutes, I, we, we will do this <laughs> to remind you. Um, E, and at the end, we will have time also for a few more questions. So please, um, I invite um, Hermias Brane to come up here for um, <clears throat> the presentation on modeling the impact of climate change on food and drought, and flood and drought, case study, a wash river basin in Ethiopia. So please, um, Hermias Brane. Is, um, yes, yes. Are you online? Yes, yes, online. Ah, online, okay, okay. Welcome, welcome. Okay. Then you have 10 minutes. Uh, you can begin. Can, can you put up the presentation, please? Yes, yeah, because uh, he's online. Okay. The presentation? Uh, one. Okay. Can you... So, yes, there is, yes. There is one it. before. One there is one before yeah. the the beginning. That that's it. So we will need uh, to be changing the. Yes. Okay. So you tell us when when to change the presentation, the the pages. I'll I'll be here uh, helping. Go ahead. Go ahead, Brane. Uh, yes, yes. Can I start? Yes. Ah, uh, okay. You have 10 uh, minutes. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, thank can, you. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Perfect. You tell us when, when to change the presentation and I, I'll do it. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Uh, uh, my... My name is Hermes. Uh, I am a PhD student in the University of Sukuba under the supervision of uh, Professor uh, Daryl Kukoji uh, in Japan. Uh, today, our today's topic is uh, modeling uh, the impact of climate change on a hydrological extreme event as a case study of uh, Awash River Basin in Ethiopia. Uh, next. Okay, as an introduction, uh, as we know, uh, uh, the term uh, related to this uh, topic is uh, climate, climate change and climate variability. Climate, uh, as we know, uh, it is uh, weather in uh, some location or place, uh, average over uh, some long period of time, or it's uh, uh, the short-term average of weather condition. Uh, so, uh, uh, related to this, Change is uh, uh, nowadays a uh, uh, very uh, sensitive issue. Uh, so uh, it is uh, defined, or it is the term uh, uh, means the change in climate variables that occur over uh, a long uh, period uh, of time, uh, typically in decade or century. Uh, so uh, 
Uh, in the other term is uh, climate variability. Uh, it is a change that occurs within a uh, shorter or a smaller time frame, such uh, as like uh, month, monthly or seasonal or uh, yearly uh, time period. So the consequence of uh, the climate change uh, is uh, have uh, many effects, uh, like uh, sea level rise, change in temperature, or change in, in precipitation. And uh, in uh, these uh, our uh, main topic, uh, extreme events like flooding, drought, or uh, 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 so like that. So uh, this uh, effect have uh, uh, some effects on various sectors like agriculture, forestry, water resource, uh, coastal area, uh, species, and natural area, and human needs as well. Next. Uh, so, uh, from the observation, uh, uh, observation of climate change in IPCC fifth assessment report, uh, as we have seen in the on the in the slide, it's uh, global average uh, land and ocean surface temperature, a global average sea level rise, and uh, the greenhouse concentration and uh, so on. So the increase uh, the the average global average, uh, the average global land and ocean surface temperature shows uh, a warning of zero point uh, eight. Uh, five in uh, from uh, ninety uh, from uh, from eighty fifty uh, to uh, up to uh, twenty uh, twenty twenty uh, twenty ten uh, the greenhouse effect uh, an anthropogenic greenhouse effect emission has increased since uh, the pre-industrial era and uh, over, the, over the period from ninety zero to to twenty ten the global mean sea level rise by 0 0.1 meter. Uh, next. So uh, our study is mainly focused in uh, climate change impact on hydrological extreme. Uh, so uh, in our uh, study era, uh, there is high potential for extreme events. Uh, such as wet season can be uh, very wet and uh, the warmer season uh, also be uh, warmer. So Ethiopia is uh, subjected to uh, high climate variability and change, uh, experiencing frequent flood and uh, drought, particularly in our uh, study area, Awashi River Basin. So in this basin, the current scenario indicates flood and drought are the uh, uh, recurrent uh, uh, common phenomena uh, with devastating effect on environment, social, and economical laws. So uh, the main objective of this study is to assess the impact of climate change on uh, uh, extreme event uh, flood and drought under current and future scenario. Uh, uh, can you next? Uh, so this is our study area. Uh, it is in middle and uh, lower Awash River Basin. Uh, it is uh, the, the climate condition is arid and semi-arid with erratic uh, rainfall. So uh, in the left side of the uh, slide, uh, the location of the study area, uh, the top part is uh, uh, lower uh, Awash Valley and uh, in the middle part or in the central part of the uh, basin is the uh, middle part. It is uh, between our station and the Millet River. Uh, Millet River. Uh, so, uh, for doing this, uh, next. Uh, to do uh, this uh, pro uh, study, uh, we use hydrological model. Take. Uh, 
uh, drought index uh, indicator, uh, standardized precipitation index, and the outputs of uh, regional climate model uh, based on uh, two uh, scenario, RCP uh, 4.5 and 8.5 scenario. Go next. Uh, so this, this is the data uh, we use for doing this study. Is a claim this data uh, observed or uh, station data and three regional uh, climate model output uh, like uh, Miro Phi, uh, CISO, uh, MRCP uh, four, and uh, as I have said before, it is. Uh, Hydrological data, we need hydrological data, uh, that is uh, discharge data from the Awash River and uh, spatial data, the uh, input for the hydrological uh, digital elevation model, uh, digital stream network, soil map and land use land cover, uh, map of uh, the steady area. Go next. Uh, so this is a, a summary of uh, our input data, uh, as I have said before, uh, spatial data and temporal data. Uh, so the, uh, in the uh, bottom part is a map of uh, all the spatial uh, data. So the, the source is like, for example, for land use, uh, we use European Space Agency land use uh, land cover map with uh, 300 meter resolution. and. Uh, so on, so go next. So, uh, climate change scenario is projected using uh, a regional climate model based on two uh, RCP scenario. Uh, uh, RC Scenario, RCP uh, scenario, uh, RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5, uh, middle uh, emission scenario and high emission scenario. So, uh, after ge generating this uh, climate variable, uh, we have to uh, bias corrected uh, the data from RCP model, uh, RCM model. So, we use linear scaling approach uh, due to its uh, simplicity and uh, suitability for uh, daily with uh, a bias correction. So uh, the future uh, scenario uh, were uh, developed by uh, uh, dividing the future time into uh, two period, uh, 2030s and uh, 2090s. Uh, 2030s uh, is from 2011 to 2050, and for uh, 2090s, it is from 2051 to 2100. Uh, so the model setup uh, was uh, used to. Brane, model was used to Brane, can you hear me? Brane, can you hear me? Uh, you, yes, you, yes. you have one minute left. Yes. Thank you. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, can you go uh, faster? Uh, so uh, the model is set up into five steps. Uh, go, Nekas. Next, uh, this is the drought anal analysis based on uh, uh, drought index, and the model is calibrated and validated using uh, 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 observed data. So this is the result of uh, drought analysis. So in our study area, the uh, drought event occur when uh, the drought index is uh, less than uh, one, so the overall categories of droughts are uh, considered mild to and the above in uh, all area, in middle and uh, lower. So in the upper part of the, p the figure, it is uh, historical, and in the bottom, it is uh, the, the future paid uh, drought projection. Uh, so next.
so this is a flood analysis uh, result. Uh, so in this, uh, it has a change of flood magnitude between uh, the current and the future period uh, in the table form. And this is the return period of uh, the flood event, uh, the change in flood magnitude between uh, current and future time period. So uh, uh, the result indicates an average increase in flood event. Uh, moreover, the analysis indicates overall increased trend in uh, frequency of flood is not linear. Uh, so uh, go next. So as, as a conclusion, uh, we address climate change impact assessment on hydrological extreme event. The model is calibrated and validated using uh, observed data. So uh, the growth analysis uh, result indicates the overall categories of droughts are considered mild and above and frequently uh, heated by growth, our study area. Uh, and uh, the maximum river flow in the future will be higher and more uh, variable in, uh, in terms of magnitude. It regularly occur. Uh, uh, so uh, it's, it's observed that climate change have significant impact on high flow condition of Awash uh, River. So uh, for future uh, investigation, to investigate the robustness of the result, uh, future uh, results on future extreme events is Thank you very much. Considering multimodal in some and socioeconomic uh, changes like land use, land cover changes. So, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Hermias. Um, okay. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation and to be joining uh, online. It was pretty good. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but possibly at the end we will have some time. And if you have uh, in the uh, participants have some questions, please stay at the end so we can we can make him a question. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. So our next speaker is Laura Decourt. And she is going to talk about evaluation of high resolution climate runs of Alaro over the Cordex Africa domain. Welcome, Laura. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Loda, um, I'm Loda, um, I'm from uh, uh, Belgium, a PhD student, um, and I will talk about the evalu evaluation of uh, the model Alaru uh, at a high resolution over the Cordex Africa domain. Um, so to really understand the impact climate change has on uh, human and natural systems, uh, we need high resolution climate data um, and uh, the project that I'm involved in is called Climavin uh, and this uh, project studies the impact of climate change on grapevines um, in several regions uh, across the world and one of those regions is uh, South Africa uh, and within Cordex there are of course a lot of climate simulations available but uh, for the African domain, um, high resolution data is still uh, scarce um, and the highest resolution is um, 25 kilometers. Um, so that's why my goal is to evaluate uh, Alaru uh, at a high resolution over the African domain. 
Um, so Alaru is uh, used as uh, for operational weather forecasting and also as an RCM uh, over Europe and Asia. Um, and now it's the first time that we used it uh, over the Cordex Africa domain. Um, we run the model at 12.5-kilometer uh, resolution uh, for a period of 20 years, and we used uh, ERA-5 as lateral boundary conditions. Uh, so for the ev evaluation, we divided um, the domain in uh, subdomains according to the IPCC. Um, uh, so we used uh, several observational data sets to um, compare our data with. Um, and we also compared our data with other models, um, so who also had uh, simulations over Africa, but at a lower resolution. Uh, and those models were, uh, had uh, era interim uh, boundary conditions. Um, so, and we're look looking at a period of ten, 10 years because that was the longest overlapping period between uh, our model, uh, our run, and the other uh, models. Um, so here you see the bias of temperature um, for uh, Alaru, um, and on the right, the range of observations. Um, and to see if our bias is a bit uh, comparable in magnitude with uh, the bias of other models, I uh, also looked at uh, this bias of three uh, other models. Um, so if we look more closely to uh, two examples, for Alaru, um, so we see um, in the Northern Hemisphere winter, there is some uh, cold bias uh, over the Sahara region. Um, and in uh, September, October, November, there was some uh, warm bias uh, in uh, Southern Africa. Um, if we look at the annual cycle of temperature, um, so we also see again this warm bias at the end of the year. So the black line is uh, Alaro, um, the grey um, is the range of observations, and the other colours are the other models. Um, so we see here the, the positive bias um, in, for Southern Africa. And then for Central Africa, we see that Alaro is following the observations quite well. Um, and it seems to do better than the other models. Um, then I also looked at maximum temperature because uh, this variable is uh, also important if we want to use uh, the model at a later stage for, uh, to calculate um, bioclimatic indices. Uh, for this, we, we need the maximum temperature as uh, input. Um, so we see for Alaru um, that there was a cold bias uh, over the whole domain for practic practically every season. Um, and for the other models, uh, there was sometimes cold bias, sometimes warm bias, uh, depending on the season or on the region. Um, if we look more closely, again, we see the, the cold bias for Alaru. And then for, uh, for example, CCLM, it's more uh, yeah, depending on the region. Um, then the bias for monthly precipitation. Um, we see on the right the range of observations again. And we see that this is quite high, so there's uh, a lot of uncertainty uh, in the observations. Um, and we see if we compare the bias of Alaru with the bias of the other models, it's uh, comparable in, in magnitude. Um, but if we look more closely to, to regions, um, so for Western Africa, we see that Alaru follows the observations quite well. Uh, so it's uh, capturing the, the West African monsoon well. Um, but the other models have a slightly different uh, pattern, or the, the peak looks different. Um, for Eastern Africa, um, we also see uh, that 
the, all the models um, are capturing the two peaks quite well. Um, but Alaru is overestimating a bit uh, if we compare with the observations and the other models. Um, so to conclude, for the performance of Alaru over Africa, um, we see that the biases are comparable to those of other models um, and that uh, it captures temperature and precipitation cycles and patterns quite well. Uh, and that it, uh, based on our uh, first results, uh, it can be used for future projections and impact studies, uh, taking into account shortcomings uh, and using bias correction when needed. Um, and if we compare this with uh, how Alaru performs over other domains, um, for example, for Asia, um, they also found an underestimation of daily temperature range, which we also saw um, uh, for the maximum temperature that there was an underestimation. Um, and then for both Europe and Asia, um, Alaro performs better for precipitation, which could be um, due to the uh, newer um, microphysics scheme of Alaro. Um, and we also saw this for Africa, uh, for some regions like Western Africa. Um, and then some perspectives. Um, so we still want to evaluate the diurnal cycle and precipitation extremes. Um, and then we want to do some future climate projections with Alaru over Africa um, and do a further downscaling to four kilometers over South Africa. Uh, and then we also would like to do an impact study um, where we investigate the relationship between grapevine phenology and climate variables and uh, we, where we'll will project uh, future bioclimatic indices. Uh, so with this, I thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, you are very on time, so great. So we have time for questions uh, in Pune. Does anyone in Pune has a question? Otherwise, here, um, Anyone has a question? Marco. You say that the, the source of the bias is for precipitation, probably is the microphysics scheme, right? I heard the first. Yeah. What about the, the temperature? Did you investigate the source? Maybe boundary layer scheme, then surface scheme? Uh, we didn't investigate it okay. yet. So, yeah. Uh, actually, on the one in Pune. Can, can okay. you hear me? Yes, first in Pune and then here. Uh, yes, go, go ahead with the question, okay, please. I am from Japan, Metrological Corporation. My question is uh, You are considering on uh, some kind of uh, forecasting. So, did you check the results with some kind of uh, station observations? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? I didn't understand. Yeah, I, I was wondering whether you compare the results with some kind of station observations. Did you check your results with the station observations? But, okay. Can you hear us properly? Ah. If I compare okay. it uh, with... Some, some kind of station observations. What other we can see today. Yeah, local observations like that, yeah. Do you check with local observations? I think so. If you didn't evaluation with the observations. Um, well, we used uh, yeah, several observational data sets, uh, and it's uh, yeah, we used CRU, uh, CPC, and um, MW, um, so that's uh, station data, um, so yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, I have a question here. Um, so over West Africa, actually, one of your maps was showing quite a dry bias during the monsoon season. And um, 
I was wondering, since uh, you must be using a convection parametrization at 12.5 kilometers, did you do some tests, uh, sensitivity tests to uh, different convection parameters or to, to try to um, improve the, the precipitation of our, uh, during the monsoon? It's a tough thing, you know, in general, in models to, to get a good monsoon. Um, so you mean the, that there was a bias for Alaru because Alaru was quite well for the West African? Ah, on the map, yeah. Well, anyway. well, yeah, yeah. You know, like, uh, made, made, like trying to uh, uh, tune a bit your parameters for convection because it's important, I guess. Uh, yeah, that would be a good thing to do. Uh, yeah, we didn't do it yet, but uh, it's, uh, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have more time, but hopefully at the end. Uh, thank you very much. You can talk to someone who wanted to ask you something. Well, uh, thank you, Laura. Our next speaker is um, Donata Melacucano, and uh, she is going to talk about the couple physical biogeochemical model CHIFEM. Uh, for a scenario analysis in the regulated Venice Lagoon system. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Donata Canu from uh, OGS, Trieste, and uh, this work was done uh, in the frame of a project that was uh, um, financed by the Ministry of the Public Works in Italy in order to understand which are the main uh, uh, effects of the closures of the mobile barriers at the lagoon inlets that are uh, already operating, starting from 2020, to protect the city of Venice from the uh, high waters and from the flooding. Uh, so <clears throat> these um, disclosures combine to the climate change effects uh, acting also in the oceans and in the sea are expected to affect somehow the state of the lagoon uh, water quality and uh, potentially can affect also the ecosystems and ecosystem services. So um, the, the model, the coupled model, that is based on a shallow water uh, hydronomic model to compute the water circulation and BFM that computes instead the cycle of uh, uh, nutrients and carbon in the water to follow the biogeochemical cycles. Uh, were implemented to simulate the water transport, diffusion, radiotrins transfer, biogeochemical cycles, and also we, interact, we insert also a pollutant, mercury, uh, to understand which is the behavior in uh, the different conditions. Uh, we, uh, uh, then we, we use the model to, um, to understand the present state, uh, compare the results with the data, and also with two climate scenarios to the end of the century, using projected downscaled atmospheric forcing and boundary conditions from regional climate model COSMO and uh, for the atmosphere, and uh, uh, from uh, the physical biogeochemical model NEMO plus OGSTM BFM. Then we implement the closures of the, the barriers, of the MOSE barriers, to understand the effect of the closures on uh, the lagoon uh, uh, properties. Where we are, so we, uh, <laughs> we go very, very into the, the small scale. Here is Europe. Uh, in the right side, we have uh, the area of Venice in the northern part of the Adriatic, not far from here. And this is the lagoon. Is a, a, um, a lagoon, is the wider, widest in the Mediterranean Sea, is a 550 square kilometer, and uh, the average depth is one meter, it's uh, uh, crossed by several channels that also allow navigations, is, uh, receives fresh water from 11 tributaries, 
and uh, exchange waters with the sea through three inlets. Is also subjected to several ongoing environmental and human pressures that uh, affect the ecosystem and uh, also the, uh, the city of Venice, like the flooding and also like the uh, environmental pollution, for example. And also the tourism is, uh, an, additional, uh, is an additional pressure to the lagunas uh, and also to the city. So um, the models is um, here used to uh, enable uh, the local um, managers to respond or to, uh, to, um, to have uh, indications on uh, different questions that are related to uh, climate change effects, to the effects of uh, land use and loadings into the loadings of fresh water and of nutrients into the lagoon and uh, uh, the effects of uh, the climate change on uh, the contamination, because we have uh, contaminated sediments resulting from past industrial activities that were not uh, economically possible to be removed from the lagoon, but they are stored in the lagoon. So how climate change is going to affect this? Uh, how the changes in the hydrodynamics is going to affect? So, um, so uh, this is one example of how downscaled models can be used to uh, provide inputs and boundaries to the very, very local scale, but that this is the scale where the uh, management actions and the planning it needs to be done and uh, needs to be supported by the scientific knowledge. This is the model, so a three-dimensional uh, shallow water hydrodynamic model um, based, uh, so the, the, um, with the variable resolution of uh, the, the, the mesh, uh, formed by 7,000 nodes. Uh, and uh, this is the scheme of the coupling of the hydrodynamic model with uh, the uh, boundaries and also with, uh, the, um, with the, the BFM, that is the biological flux model that uh, computes the um, the interactions and the transformation among 50 variables representing the uh, biogeochemical process cycles of uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon in the water column. <clears throat> and here is uh, the mercury model that was also coupled with CHIFEM that again uh, reproduced the cycle of three different forms uh, of mercury, one of which is toxic to uh, the, um, uh, to uh, the uh, or, uh, organisms that live in, uh, in the environment, but also to the humans that, for example, um, uh, uh, eat fishes that, are, that have bioaccumulated the methyl mercury. And uh, in fact, we also used uh, the model to simulate the bioaccumulation in one clam that is a uh, one clam that is a uh, harvested in the Lagoon of Venice. So <clears throat> the scheme that I have already um, cited, mentioned, is this one. So we have a high resolution cl regional climate model. And then we statistically computed the nutrient input uh, using data from uh, the present state conditions and using projections from, for the scenarios. And uh, the same way, we, uh, we used data and uh, we interpolated the data applying statistics to set uh, the present state uh, boundary conditions at the sea. And uh, uh, we used uh, the model projections uh, uh, of the marine state uh, also performing the bias corrections that was needed uh, based on uh, the comparison of uh, the model with uh, the present state data. And then these were fed into the models. Uh, <clears throat> so these no, sorry. Uh, no, what? No, I'm going. You need to yes, I, I wanted to go back. This one, okay. Uh, so we did the, the the present state scenarios and then the, the scenario simulations to uh, uh, for the two um, RCP 8.5 and 4.5. Um, with and without closures at the, the barrier uh, at the inlets. We have uh, many data. The Venice Lagoon is a, 
a really uh, well-known system where uh, many, many different projects and activities were carried out in, different, in, in the last 20 years. So this was uh, good and bad for our modeling activity. And uh, these are the number of hours of closures of the mobile barriers according to the, um, according to the model projections of the sea level rise. Here we see that uh, in 2019 we had only very, very few events that needed to be, to, to the mobile barriers to be used. These are projected to increase in 2050 and uh, very, go really, really high at the end of the century under the RCP 8.5. That means that uh, at the end of the century, the lagoon is closed almost every day, at least for a few hours, but uh, closing requires time. So this, could be, th this will become a problem for the lagoon, for the economy, and so on. Okay. And uh, so the model was used to compare the results uh, of the ecosystem indicators like uh, water resident time for the present state and for the future, sea level rise, we have uh, the monthly variability of sea level rise in the mid future and in the far future, you see. And uh, the model is um, able to is run uh, with uh, uh, five minutes time step. So it provides uh, a daily output. Uh, it allows to explore the monthly and daily variability. Here we have uh, the monthly maps uh, of, uh, for example, temperature. We see how temperature increases, in particular in the summer and spring months in the two scenarios, uh, 8.5 and 8445. Here we have the temperature anomalies. Uh, in the mid and the far future. And we also computed the marine heat waves uh, that uh, um, are present at the end of the century for uh, at, um, already in the mid century for 30% of the time. And uh, also the trophic state of the lagoon is projected to be changed in the future. And, and, also, and, and also we explore the effects of the mobile closures. Um, okay, this is uh, also the effects on uh, the contamination. We see that uh, the model highlights that we have a decrease uh, of contamination in the mid future and an increase in the far future. This is not uh, so uh, obvious. So we need a model that uh, takes into account the different processes, the sedimentary processes, the hydrology, and so on, to be able to understand how the different uh, processes will interact uh, and uh, affect our system. Thank you. Thank you, Donata. <laughs> we have time for one question. Anyone online or here? Marco? <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much, Donata. So we welcome our next speaker, Inna Semenova, that will talk to us about uh, future wildfire condition in Ukraine under CP 8.5 climate scenario. In a stage is yours. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I would like to present uh, this short uh, part of the uh, common study, which provided in Odessa State Environmental University uh, with my uh, PhD student, Ruslan Koval. Uh, the study about uh, uh, wildfire weather condition in Ukraine. It's a very important uh, question because uh, Ukraine is uh, the most uh, territory of uh, southern uh, Europe uh, every year affected uh, by uh, wildfires uh, 
with uh, uh, different uh, reasons. Uh, more than 18% uh, of Ukrainian territory covered by forests, and uh, the third part of these forests is uh, pine trees, is which very flam uh, flammable. Uh, during past uh, uh, 30 years, uh, uh, in the forest areas uh, of our country, is about uh, 100,000 fires uh, occurred. Um, and uh, in the last uh, three years, uh, uh, territory of Ukraine uh, became the most burned area of the Europe. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, so, uh, due to uh, large fires in uh, 2020 and 2022. Uh, in 2020, these fires, uh, uh, which connect with uh, several drought in Ukraine, and in 2022, most fires occur in the uh, military combat zone of Ukraine. As you can see, this is this zone. Uh, uh, on the satellite images with hot spots for July last year. Um, <coughs> current, uh, some, uh, some about current wildfire statistics in Ukraine. Uh, analysis uh, of this dynamics of these fires uh, um, shows that it's a sustainable phenomenon. It's about uh, uh, an average annual number of wildfires ranged from uh, 10 cases in the western region and uh, to more than 400 cases in the um, forest uh, areas of Ukraine in the east part. Uh, more, more of these cases are caused by, by forest visitors, and uh, a large part of these cases uh, is, uh, is uh, uncontrolled agriculture burnings. Um, <coughs> Uh, what about uh, weather conditions, uh, conditions and wildfires? Uh, we are know that the frequency and intensity of wildfires uh, 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 usually depended on the current weather and climate conditions. Uh, in the seasonal distribution in Ukraine, we have the uh, three, um, um, three periods of uh, maximum fire activity. It's the spring period in uh, March and uh, April. It's uh, uh, usually uh, summer in August. And uh, next peak, it's uh, um, October in autumn. Uh, analysis of uh, average temperature in Ukraine last uh, uh, 75 years uh, showed that uh, the temperature is uh, rising and uh, the trend is positive and significantly, um, significantly uh, important for Ukraine. Uh, so the heat waves uh, also increased during the last uh, 20 years, uh, very significant. Uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this study, we used uh, the simple angstrom index for evaluation uh, fire weather condition in the future period uh, from um, 2021 uh, 2070 uh, 250 years period uh, in which temperature uh, expected to rise in ukraine and uh, uh, relative humidity uh, expected to decrease in territory, average territory of Ukraine. Uh, for evaluation, we use the model data from uh, RCM MPI REMO 2009. Uh, and uh, uh, the data was uh, used from, uh, from uh, local time at uh, uh, 13 o'clock. So, uh, this, uh, this maps present uh, the special distribution, seasonal distribution of the Angstrom Index. Uh, the study area included the territory of Ukraine, uh, so uh, it's uh, so much the territory of Ukraine, but uh, the territory of Ukraine is nearest this uh, region, occupied this region. Uh, so, uh, 
in all season, in, uh, uh, we have the distribution, uh, quasi-zonal distribution with uh, the small, uh, with the small uh, uh, values in the uh, northern part of the territory and uh, the uh, largest, uh, uh, largest values in the uh, 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 southern part of Ukraine, but uh, but uh, uh, this distribution characterizes it uh, in uh, uh, winter and in autumn, and in uh, the summer and spring we have the smallest uh, uh, values, which correspond to high uh, risk of fire danger in uh, southern part of uh, Ukraine, of course. Uh, uh, of, co uh, of course, we have the uh, clearly seasonal. Uh, time course with minimum values in the summer months and uh, uh, biggest values in the uh, winter. Uh, concerning the trends, uh, the trends uh, around the study area, uh, all time trends uh, show that uh, values of index will be decrease around uh, this territory study area and especially in the uh, western part uh, of the Ukraine and uh, nearest areas. Uh, anomalies uh, also uh, became the, um, negative uh, to the end of the study period. Uh, the seasonal distribution uh, shows that, uh, uh, that negative trends expected uh, for winter, spring, and summer, and uh, in spring and summer these trends are uh, significantly, statistically significant, and in autumn the trends near the uh, uh, natural, natural values. Frequency, frequency uh, days with high uh, fire danger also evaluate, and uh, we can see that uh, uh, from decade to decade, uh, expected to um, uh, increasing of uh, index and increasing the area uh, of uh, index which uh, correspond to high uh, uh, fire risk activity. Uh, the um, maximum uh, maximum fre frequency it uh, changes from 70 uh, 85 uh, days per year to uh, more than 100 uh, days per year with uh, uh, high uh, fire danger level. So uh, our summary of our, our short research, it's uh, according to projection, we have that uh, climate change to make wildfires more frequent and intense uh, in the regional level and uh, a simple angstrom index uh, also suitable to determine the impact of climate change on fire weather condition uh, and in Ukraine uh, we expected uh, under most severe scenario uh, the significant increase in annual number of days with high fire level especially in spring and summer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Inna, for your very interesting presentation. Any question from the audience, from also for people from Pune? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for your uh, nice uh, presentation, indeed interesting. And uh, you do show an uh, increase in terms of wildfires um, over the decades. So I'm just wondering, uh, you know, in the existing conditions and even in the future, I mean, there are many anthropogenic factors that also affect wildfires. So uh, is this something that uh, can be also taken into account in terms of some of the anthropogenic fires what, for wildfires? Or is this all uh, natural? Uh... Uh, no, uh, I agree that uh, the most uh, region for wildfire, but uh, in, this, in this study we used only temperature and uh, relative humidity, okay. on, only. So it's only, uh, it's uh, assuming that it is, uh, there's no anthropogenic uh, impacts. 
Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So, uh, actually, uh, I have the same question, actually, what she said. So, when I was reading your initial uh, points, you said that the maximum power occurring in your region is because of the human interventions. So mostly the visitors who are going there and is one of the key reasons for the fire there, if I got the message correct. So, and then obviously you are trying, then you know, climate change will have an impact, there's no doubt there, but that factor you are already highlighting that this is happening. So are you taking care of that uh, thing? And also, um, um, the, your RH is, is, is decreasing. What is the reason for decreasing of RH in future? Thank you. <laughs> hope, I, hope you I, got I, me. I don't understand for this question. Thank you. Hi, Ina. I'm Matilde from Uruguay. And my question is, how did you decide which fire index to use? Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, I use this index uh, because uh, it uh, includes uh, the most important components of yeah. the climate change, which described it's temperature no, and humidity is, uh, is uh, addition to the temperature. Maybe it's a parameter which characterizes uh, uh, the state of the atmosphere, local state of the atmosphere, uh, suitable for the wildfires. Uh, it's a simple, simple. I agree, it's a very simple parameter, but uh, um, and it's include uh, the temperature which uh, most effective uh, projected uh, in the future models. Thank you. Basically. So we thank again Ina for this interesting talk and for the, the discussion. So we need to go ahead now. So I invite now the next speaker, yeah. Eric Yal, is here, okay. Yeah. That will talk to us about the assessment of the regional climate model Rexian 5 and atmospheric chemistry simulation over Africa. Yeah. Okay, hello everybody, I'm uh, Eric Yao from Côte d'Ivoire and um, today I will, I'm going to talk about my PhD work um, that is with um, the, asmet, the assessment and uh, the use of regional climate chemistry model to, to apply to atmospheric nitrogen cycle over Africa. So. We know that the, um, the nitrogen cycle is a complex one involving um, different compartments of uh, the, earth, uh, the earth system, um, particularly the atmosphere, that is very important. And um, it is also the, the, the cycle, it's also the cycle most um, uh, dis um, disrupted by anthropogenic uh, um, activities, and that is um, particularly true in tropical regions in uh, the context of uh, climate change and population growth. Um, that is what motivates the INSA project and my thesis. Um, and in this, uh, in within, uh, within this uh, framework, we set up uh, an integrated tool based on RHCM5 to study the, um, the impact of um, the climate variability and uh, anthropogenic uh, activities on this cycle. So in the rest of my um, presentation, I will present you the pre preliminary results of this work. So as I said, um, this work is based on the uh, uh, RSM5 model, 
which um, considered um, various physics parameters. And uh, all our simulations um, are performed for now uh, from January to December um, 2014 uh, over Africa with a spatial resolution of uh, 30 kilometers. So for a more for a more accurate representation of uh, African chemistry, we have done uh, important upgrades and improvements, which um, concerns uh, emission inventories, um, chemical boundary condition, uh, which is now based on uh, CAMS uh, reanalysis, um, dry and wet deposition, and so on. So, as a necessary step, um, we evaluate the African climate during the African monsoon. And uh, it is important to, to know that in order to have um, um, the most realistic uh, African climate representation, uh, we, we, have, uh, we have done um, a lot of sensitivity uh, tests uh, varying diverse um, physics parameters. So here, we introduce the, the simulated wine compared to uh, the RERA 5 reanalysis. Uh, we can so um, we can see um, overall, uh, overall uh, the, um, that uh, the the model captures the main feature of um, of a muson circulation with a good with a good position like um, a position of a muson front here, uh, despite the um, underestimation of uh, the. Um, uh, the motion flow intensity. Uh, these figures show the precipitation and uh, the surface temperature for the same period. Um, we can see that uh, the model uh, tends to reproduce the, the spatial precipitation distribution and uh, the main um, um, the main uh, um, um, Spatial gradient of uh, of the surface temperature with uh, a wet bias, you can see with a limited bias, sorry, a limited barrier, but uh, which um, remains reasonable um, considering the range of uh, bias shown by Codex RCMs. So we can um, say that the simulation quality uh, can be considered good enough for. Um, for supporting further um, analysis on uh, uh, atmospheric chemistry. So, for chemistry, um, we try first to access how the model represents the, the ozone field um, because of its importance in regulating uh, um, main atmosphere, atmosphere component, especially nitrogen species. So, simulated values. Um, evaluated against CAMS reanalysis. We can see on this figure that uh, RCM5 shows a good consistent uh, with, um, with CAMS, but tends to overestimate uh, the surface concentration of ozone. And uh, this difference in concentration can be linked um, to um, difference in uh, um, some paras parameterization such as emission inventories, dry, depo dry deposition um, uh, treatment. Um, we are now um, interested in, in the comparison of um, simulated ozone and uh, the INDAF. And the, the INDAF network uh, measured the ozone on its representative station of uh, forest uh, wet and uh, dry savannas. This scatter plot uh, shows overall uh, an overestimation of uh, uh, simulated ozone uh, compared to the, the observation, so in that, uh, on the three types of ecosystem. But on the um, uh, right, we can see on this figure that even um, state of the art model like um, Geoscam in uh, orange and uh, comes with analysis in green uh, also overestimate the, the surface ozone. 
However, we can see um, a good tracking by the simulated ozone in blue uh, of the, the ozone seasonality given by observation in, uh, in red here. Okay, so if now we are looking for um, specific species uh, more directly linked to nitrogen cycle like uh, NO2, which is very important for this cycle, uh, we can see on this figure a consistency between uh, Kamsky analysis and uh, Rexium 5 um, with uh, a strong seasonal uh, cycle linked to um, fire activities. I want to talk about uh, biomass burning uh, emission. You can see, yeah. But uh, we can see also um, that uh, the model uh, underestimates uh, um, shows the um, a lower concentration in the cell regions compared to, um, compared to Kamsky analysis. And uh, that, can be, um, that could be uh, uh, related to another source of um, emission not taken into account in, uh, in the model. Okay, so on um, the, the in-depth, um, on the Indar forest, on the Indar forest and the uh, white savanna, um, we notice uh, the, um, a good simulated seasonality of uh, sulfurs, um, of sulfurs um, NO2, compared to the observation in DAF and uh, the state of the art model like uh, Geoschem and CAMS. But on dry savanna here, uh, we see an underestimation by the model of uh, uh, sulfurous uh, NO2. Okay, so um, now we assess the, um, the impact of, um, the, of the burgeoning NO emission uh, on uh, NO2 and uh, the, the surface uh, ozone now uh, taken to account in the, in the model. So, on, on dry savanna, uh, for example, where we had uh, uh, underestimation, uh, we noticed that uh, an, addition, uh, an additional biogenic NO uh, emission tends to uh, or leads, uh, leads to increase um, sufferers uh, NO2, bringing them closer um, uh, observed value. On your right, uh, we can see also that um, um, surface ozone tends to be reduced uh, via um, ozone titration characteristic of VOC limited regime in uh, um, biogenic NO source uh, area. You can see here. Yeah. So, in conclusion, uh, we can see that uh, we have developed a um, a system which has demonstrated uh, the, uh, the importance of uh, biogenic uh, source for species uh, linked to um, nitrogen cycle. So in the future, uh, uh, we will uh, carry out um, long-term uh, simulation for variability uh, studies. Thank you for your kind question. We thank our speaker for this very interesting talk. Any question from the audience? Hi, Alison Steiner from mm -hmm. University of Michigan. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, have you started to look yet at any of the biogenic VOCs and how the model is simulating that and if that might impact the ozone differences you see with the reanalysis? Um, can you repeat, please, um, the question? Have you looked yet at the biogenic VOCs, like coming from vegetation? Like, the ice, is the model simulating isoprene and monoterpenes? Because that could influence some of the ozone differences you see with the reanalysis. Um, I'm not sure I well understand the question, but um, the biogenic VOCs is um, uh, calculated online. 
uh, with Rexiem. I, 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 I talked about here the, the biogenic NO emission, uh, which is implemented in the, in, in the model, and uh, we assess the, M, the, the impact of uh, uh, this um, uh, new parameterization of uh, biogenic NO emission. Uh, Overall, um, the biogenic viruses are also, um, already calculated online. Yes, thank you. Oh, okay. You you said that um, the anthropogenic and biomass burning emissions have been updated and specified. Can you tell us how? Okay. Um, so, if you want. Um, the the gas phase okay the the gas phase chemistry uh, implement uh, model implemented in the model uh, named uh, CBMZ carbon bond mechanisms in the model um, contains or um, uh, taking into, into account um, several and uh, specific species okay in the model so when you use or, or, or when you want to use um, um, like um, uh, uh, em em emission inventories, like anthropogenic emission or biomass burning uh, inventories emission, you have to um, to to aggregate um, uh, the species of this specific inventory emission uh, em emission. You, you, you have to aggregate these uh, different species to build. Uh, the the CBMZ uh, yes the CBMZ uh, uh, species to make it consistent with uh, this uh, this uh, species. So we thank again uh, Eric for this very interesting talk. So we need to move on uh, because we are running out of time. So um, next speaker Maria Vittoria Struglia that will talk to us about the dynamical downscaling of CMC6 model over the Medcordex region an application of the NAR Regional 2.0 to the assessment of the expected climate change impacts. Hi. Uh, good morning. I am uh, Maria Vittoria Struglia. I am here representing, as you can see, a uh, huge, quite huge uh, group of people. Uh, as uh, this uh, work was really uh, a big effort and uh, all the climate uh, laboratory at NEA was, uh, was involved. Um, I will speak about the downscaling of a CIMIP-6 model over the Metcordex region, but I will focus mainly on uh, expected climate change impacts. Uh, in particular, um, I will uh, um, focus on the effects of high-resolution RC coupling for the representation of two particularly uh, impact events, um, marine heat waves and sea level high. Um, this is a, a short outline of the presentation. I will be very brief on uh, the first part, and uh, I'll try to um, go uh, a bit deeper into the part of uh, impact studies. Um, all the results uh, are, have been published recently in um, this paper in, on climate dynamics. So. Um, I will be really uh, very brief. I have selected just one, some um, results, but you can find uh, all information in, the, in the, um, the paper. Um, this is uh, the model setup and experimental design. Um, this is uh, the Medcordex region, and we have highlighted also the boxes, uh, which are the um, prudence boxes uh, over which we made most uh, of our uh, validation. Um, we have we made uh, five simulations: the Hintka simulation, the historical simulation, and three scenario simulations, all forced by. Um, the MPI ESM 12HR uh, um, model, uh, which belongs to the CIMIP 6 uh, uh, family. And these are, these are mainly characteristics of the, uh, of the simulation. So um, the model uh, run at uh, a horizontal resolution of 12 kilometers for the atmosphere and uh, 10 kilometers more or less for the ocean. 
Um, just a few words to convince you that the model uh, is uh, pretty good. Uh, so I have shown uh, um, the results uh, of the evaluation uh, of the model. Um, in particular, here we show the uh, air temperature, uh, surface air temperature. And uh, we have three panels uh, just uh, to show how the model works with respect to means, to pattern correlation, pattern variability, and internal variability. So um, in uh, the horizontal line, we have uh, the uh, prudence domains. Uh, so as uh, far it, um, um, about the, the mean biases, uh, we have quite good results. Uh, we are very close to the era five, which is the, the, um, the black box. And we just have uh, um, two biases, a cold one and a warm one, uh, respectively, in uh, winter and uh, um, summer in uh, two regions, the Eastern uh, Europe and in the Alp region also uh, a, um, a warm bias in, um, in summer. Um, as to the um, pattern variability, we can see that uh, the downscaling generally improves a lot uh, the, special the, um, the special variability with respect to the, to the drive as, as expected, of course. And also in Toronto, variability is uh, well reproduced both uh, for the hindcast and the simulation and the historical simulations. Um, as to the ocean, here uh, we, um, we show um, on the um, left side, on the left panel, the um, SSD. You can use the... Ah, okay, fine. Thanks. Oh, fine. Uh, on the left panel, uh, we have the, uh, S, um, the SST. Uh, the first column is uh, the um, satellite uh, product, uh, their observation. And then uh, we plot differences with respect to this mean for the hindcast and the historical uh, runs. As you can see, uh, we have a warm bias in um, winter and a cold bias in uh, summer. So um, this means that uh, um, even though the uh, seasonal cycle is well reproduced by our model and mean, uh, however, we have a, um, a little reduction in the amplitude of the seasonal cycle of SSD. Uh, on the left side, uh, we show uh, the um, in sea level, uh, just, oh, sorry. And we compare Hindcast and historical run with respect uh, of uh, uh, satellite uh, um, observation, I mean dynamical topography. And here we have the, um, the interrun, the, um, the time series of both uh, uh, the, um, the model and the observation. So uh, as you can see, um, um, the circulation of the model uh, of the ocean is quite well reproduced. Uh, we have all the uh, features known for the Mediterranean, and uh, uh, we clearly uh, reproduce uh, the main uh, the zones for the um, intermediate and uh, deep uh, water formation. Now we go in the, in the main topic of, the, um, of this uh, presentation, so the projected changes. Uh, we have evaluated it with respect to uh, re some relevant uh, um, essential climate values, values and then uh, ocean climate values. Uh, here we show um, surface, air, and sea temperatures. Um, on the left panel, we have the mean over the whole basin. We have compared all the three scenarios. So what we can uh, observe is that uh, until the, uh, the mid of the century, all the three scenarios go uh, well altogether, but uh, then they diverge, especially the most severe one, uh, which uh, uh, reaches uh, uh, something like uh, um, a 
three, three degrees uh, of, uh, um, of temperature um, uh, increment at the end of the, of the century. And uh, what we observe also is that our dynamical simulation, our um, dynamical downscaling, um, is uh, always a bit lower than, uh, than the driver for all the three scenarios. Uh, on the right side, we have the projected climate changes of temperature, um, the, the, the pattern, we show the pattern. And as we can see, uh, of course, we have a strong, um, um, warming, uh, especially in, uh, in uh, summer and especially in, uh, in regions uh, of um, North Africa and uh, um, Spain. Uh, these are the projected changes for precipitation. Um, here we can see that uh, uh, the main result is that we uh, obtain uh, a decrease in precipitation, especially for the uh, most severe scenarios and uh, concentrated uh, uh, on uh, the um, southern part uh, uh, of the domain, while on the northern part, it seems we have uh, an increase in uh, precipitation. Uh, now we go to the, to the ocean. Um, here is, a, I'm sorry, a bit, a bit boring table, uh, but it's uh, quite uh, useful because we here report uh, the, um, the characteristic of the uh, hydrography of our ocean model. So we have temperature, oh my God, temperature and salinity. And uh, here he, we, we compare the circulation component uh, of, uh, at the end of the projection with respect to the um, historical uh, period. So uh, here, as you can see, we, we get warming on all the um, depths of the ocean. And here, before the um, circulation component, uh, sea surface height, uh, we can see that uh, we have uh, um, um, an increment, uh, and in some regions also a, a decrease in sea level height. But uh, with respect to the driving, we um, really uh, are able to um, to go in in uh, um, in, in the uh, obtain different results uh, for different regions and different coastal areas. Uh, this is uh, uh, the projection of sea level rise for the three scenarios uh, and uh, with all the components. Um, okay, you can see that uh, the driver, the model are quite uh, near to the, uh, the mean ensemble mean. I go a bit faster because this is the last result that I want to uh, show you, which is quite uh, interesting. And it's about, about marine heat waves. Um, here, I just show you an example, uh, which is uh, uh, on the uh, central Adriatic. And um, this plot means, uh, um, well, first, as definition, we uh, used the, that uh, um, marine heat waves is a period of at least five consecutive days during which the mean temperature over a specific area is above a um, long-term expect daily value. And uh, in, the, um, in this uh, panel, uh, you can see uh, year for year, the intensity, which is represented by the height of the bar of the marine heat waves during that year, and also the duration of the marine heat waves, uh, which is uh, expressed with the colors, uh, with this color bar. Uh, so the, the important result, uh, and, and we used also um, a changing threshold. So we have been uh, counting marine heat waves uh, uh, just uprising our threshold uh, from um, the, the basic uh, seasonal cycle of the historical period. And so the important thing is that uh, uh, intensity is uh, really uh, increasing, especially for the sev most severe scenario. But the important thing is that what is uh, an exception, an anomaly in the historical period may become uh, the normality in uh, the future scenarios. Uh, so 
this is the main conclusions, and uh, I just want you to keep two key messages uh, that uh, dynamical downscaling uh, uh, is uh, quite useful um, and uh, helps us uh, to improve our um, evaluation of uh, uh, impacts, uh, especially for the marine uh, part, for the ocean part, which are really important also for ecosystem and coastal uh, system. For, and, and I show you the two main examples, sea level rise and marine heat waves. Uh, just a bit of a thanks to our sponsor because uh, all the project, all the work was um, been funded by um, several projects and thank you. Thank you, Maria Vittoria, for this very interesting talk. Time just for ve one very quick question. Is any? One question from Pune. Uh, okay, from Pune. Hmm? Go ahead. So uh, it was it's, uh, first of all very nice talk. Thanks. Just uh, wanted to know that this uh, marine heat wave. Uh, what I would expect that the uh, in future you are saying that the duration is increasing. Now you have shown that the 180 days more than 200 days. So this means that are we going in a state where we are going to have a permanent marine heat wave? Or, and then also the intensity should reduce. Period, if period is increasing, the intensity should reduce because intensity obviously is representing the event numbers. So your comment, please. Um, I, are you asking for the marine heat waves, this plot? I understand? Yeah, yeah correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we see 200 days and all. We have three scenarios, of course. We have difference among the uh, less severe and the more severe. Um, actually, you don't have a decrease in intensity, even in the less severe scenarios, huh? because, but it keeps more or less the same intensity and um, a bit uh, increase uh, in uh, uh, the duration. Um, this is not surprising because, uh, um, as you see in this other uh, picture, uh, the less severe scenarios uh, um, indicates that uh, um, the three scenarios go quite well together till the middle century, and then the less severe uh, actually uh, shows uh, um, a decrease uh, with respect. Um, so um, mitigation measures can be effective, uh, but they will take time to, uh, to be effective. Uh, I, I hope I answer your question. Yeah, it's okay. In, in the interest of time, we will just it's fine. Thank you, Maria Vittoria. We are running out of time. Okay. So we have the last question. We have the last uh, um, presentation. I think it's online, right? Pankai, are you there? Yeah, it's me only. Okay. Could you please share your screen? Yes. Perfect. So uh, you have 10 minutes. Uh, because we are running out of time, we are a little bit uh, late today. So I just go on presentation board. I, I hope it's, everything is okay. Yeah, perfect. perfect. So, um, so thank you very much, and good afternoon to all. And uh, actually, actually, this talk is of one of my group member, uh, and she is not well, Disha. So I'm trying to present her work, PhD work, and uh, at least I will present what she wanted to present. Uh, any technical questions, I might just pass to her. So what uh, what we are trying to look is that the how the different species will be affected with the rate of climate change, especially to the biodiversity hotspot reasons. And it's already reported, very well reported, that so the whole world ship uh, and the high elevation ship, and also in the oceans we are going more deeper or higher. And if you talk about Himalayas ecosystem, uh, with a biodiversity hotspot hosting more than more than three thousand endemic plants, many, many important uh, 
orangutans and also 300 and 1,000 birds species. So, uh, and then very uh, biodiversity hotspot regions to look around the changes into the things. So, to introduce this um, topic, so quantification of climate change and its impact on the different ecosystem. So, usually we do the to look into the different matrices, indices, uh, such as anomalies, probability of extreme events, and identification of uh, climates. That's the one way of looking at it. And another, what we are trying to do is the velocity of climate change. And the concept given by Laurie et al. It is defined as the instantaneous velocity along the Earth's surface that an organism could maintain the field to the changing climate to ensure its survival. And we will see uh, CC is, is a regional matrix of climate assessment, and it is easy to interpret comprehensive matrix and does not involve biological inferences because that's again a challenge. Because if we start incorporating biological uh, parameters, so then the data and all the challenge, and obviously, it can be looked at in the and exposed. So VOCC is, is uh, largely represent the speed and direction with which the climate of a particular region is expected to change. And it also estimates the speed required for the species to track the, uh, track the change, changing climate. It, however, it does not give the real migration rates of the species. So we will see that uh, the, the magnitude of, of change, but not we will not tell, at least this study will not tell in which direction that, that uh, migration is, is happening. So what, what we wanted to look into to present the multivariate estimates of the shift of climate um, space for the trans-Himalayans and the Himalayan biogeographic regions for the present and also for the future. And we also look, want to look into the anthropogenic influence of the region. Uh, the study area is the Himalayan, trans-Himalayan regions. That's what we are looking at it. And um, obviously, it's um, very vulnerable to them. And <laughs> now, what we have done, we have looked, we used the era five uh, data, which already provide 5.5 degree, uh, 19 biochemical variables. And also, we are using a regional Earth system model for this temperature precipitation data we have used to create an <laughs> Uh, I will quickly introduce the reasonable system models which we are reading here. We have already introduced the audience here. For the ICTP audience, we have this uh, uh, this earth system, regional earth system model, which is uh, having a REMO and gradual discharge model and the full ocean model, full value chemical cycle. And we have shown that the model has a, a potential. Uh, I'm showing here the CMEPS 5 model ensemble, CMEPS 6 model ensemble. Cortex model ensemble and then RESM ensemble. Uh, the model clearly shows that the biases significantly reduce when we go to 25 kilometer and 1 kilometer. And not only the inter annual scale, scale intra-annual scale, also the uh, migration of IT season and all are very well captured. So, this uh, I'm not going to go into detail. Just to give a statement here that the uh, model stored high scale to be used for these kind of studies. Coming back to the topic, so after obtaining the 19 bioclimatic variables from the uh, two products, one is TRI and another is RESM, uh, ECS uh, are calculated to reduce the dimension, and literally 19 species uh, out of 19 species were sufficient enough to explain the maximum variance of the system. So the rest of them were not um, uh, was not required. So to look into the velocity of climate change was calculated for the selected species as the ratio of their temporal and the spatial gradient. And then the final velocity was derived for each time period, taking the ensemble mean of the species, so six species ensemble. And then the spatial gradient. And then the, with this, because we have uh, to avoid the higher order of magnitudes, we have looked into the normalized thing. So for that, we have calculated the climate climatic exposure for each time period derived from the normalization of UCC. Uh, one value is indicating a higher vulnerable region and, and zero is, is less exposed regions. To talk about the results, when we look into the um, high gas simulations, the uh, trans-Himalayas and the Himalayan region, the 
the velocity, it is the velocity of climate change which we have uh, produced. So, you know, we see higher velocities of climate change in, in, in that area and the historical simulation, however, which is posed by the MPIS MLR, uh, shows, shows that signal, but the magnitude is, is less. In the mid future, that, that, that um, velocity is, is twofold and, and transmalia may be threefold, uh, whereas in the far future, it is uh, around uh, four to six fold uh, increase in the far future. Uh, the same results can be uh, has been looked into in the form of exposure. Again, the exposure is 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 more in the, in the trans Malian region and also over the Malian region. Uh, the uh, rate and all is is all is more or less very similar to the to the VUCC, and the trans Himalaya will face higher climatic exposure and thus will be more vulnerable than the Himalaya in the future. Scenario. So that's what one of the points, and I'm also we look into the histograms and distribution. So this is for the Himalaya, and this is for the uh, Trans Himalayas, and what we see that the grid boxes here largely for the mid future or the far future, the distribution is more or less same. Uh, but whereas the mm, uh, means less number of grid boxes are affected, but here the spread is negatively skewed and, and it's very large also. So in the far future, more areas more areas or more grid boxes will be vulnerable to the uh, higher velocities. Another thing what she looked around was the footprints of uh, uh, over in this area and that was looked for the two um, snapshots I think this is uh, 93 and 2009. What she is it is looking based on several parameters that defines the footprints she has calculated. And what she noticed that we, uh, if we look into the difference from the 2003 versus 2009, then we, uh, uh, the footprints uh, have increased in the in, in that area. And there are obviously uh, negative values because we have subtracted 93 minus 2000, that's why negative values indicates increased human presence in the, in the year 2009. And the natural ecosystem of Himalaya or Trans Himalaya is becoming increasingly disturbed due to anthropogenic activity. This adds to um, synergetics uh, pressure on the climate change in the region. So, um, yeah, this anthropogenic impact obviously is really visible by the data source which we have used. To conclude, so have climate velocities in the far future compared to the mid future, and both. Uncertainty in the future projections with the varying emission scenarios and potential underlying and estimation of the models. So obviously, if you change the model, uh, the results will change. It's one model study so, so far. And uh, trans Himalayan exhibit greater future climatic exposure than the Himalayas, and increasing human footprint or anthropogenic influence in Himalaya, uh, genetic area, uh, by geographic zones, is contributing to the effect of climate change. Thank you. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Pankai, for being on, perfectly on time. So any question for our speaker from the audience or for uh, online? I have a quick question. Uh, it's a very nice presentation. So are you interested to quantify what kind of species is uh, migrating to <coughs> climatic zones? Actually, this, this we have not, um, was not the intention. We want to look into <laughs> both plant species as well as the mammals. So we are not quantifying because there are and this is the first studies we are trying in the Asia to do this. There is a study for Europe, America, there's no study for Asia or South America. So in individual species like let's say tiger or the, the one like one one example, that are there of course, but not on a larger scale because we really want to look from climate perspective, not from the biosciences. Thank you, Pankai, again for your presentation and for replying to the question. Uh, I think we can close the session now. Uh, now the coffee break is in, in the terrace upstairs. And then after, at uh, half past 11, we are going to gather again in the CISA building, in the, in the room where we started the conference in the last two days. So thank you again to all the speakers. Thank you for attending this session. See you later. Bye. Now, now again we have to go back.